from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want to speak on John's Gospel, the 11th chapter, the 25th verse. And Jesus is speaking to Martha. Lazarus has died, and Lazarus is in the tomb, and Jesus is trying to comfort Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. And here's what he says. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. You know, the Bible talks about three parts of us. The Bible says that we are built with three things. First, we have a body. Now, your body allows you to see people, to walk, to hear, to shake a hand, but the body can never make a friend. It is the soul and the personality that has the capacity to love a person and to have social relationships. And most of us don't like to go to funerals. We don't like to talk about death. And we in America have a great fear. Adam and Eve and said, thou shalt not surely die. And he still uses the lie on you. You say somebody else is going to be killed in that automobile crash. It's going to be somebody else that's going to get pneumonia and die. It's going to be somebody else that gets cancer. It's somebody else that's going to have a heart attack. But one of these days, it'll be you. We look at our screens and we see motion pictures like Gable and Lombard or pictures on Marilyn Monroe. And we think that they're alive, or we even see former President Kennedy come back on the screen, or Martin Luther King come back on the screen, and somehow we get it in our minds that, that they're alive right now, just like that in the same old body, but they're not, they're dead. So the body dies. Everybody's body is going to die. Your body will go to the grave. The second part of us is called the soul. Sometimes we interchange it, soul and spirit. But I believe there's a difference between the soul and the spirit. But the soul, what is the soul? The soul can think, the soul can decide, the soul can desire. The soul can know, it can love, it can hate, it can react. To sum it up, the soul is that part of us that we call personality. Now, I have two dogs at home, German Shepherds. Highly trained dogs, I might add. One of them's trained to run when you come, and the other one's trained to growl or bite if necessary. But you know, I've noticed that those dogs, they have emotions, they grieve, they, wor they seem to worry if they're not fed in time, and they get angry and they love, and they each have their own personality. Because you see, a dog has a soul just like you did. The whole animal world has a soul. If animal has body and personality similar to humans, then what makes humans different? Have you ever thought of that? What makes you different than your dog? What makes you superior to an elephant? What makes you superior to any other animal? The third thing, the body, the soul, the animals have bodies, the animals have souls, but no animal has a spirit. The spirit is something that only humans have. Man possesses something in addition to his body and his soul that the animal does not have. He has the spirit, and the spirit is totally unique. The ability, you know what the spirit is? The spirit is the ability to know and to enjoy and to have fellowship with Almighty God. The God of the universe, the God that made the stars and the moon and the sun and the whole world. You, just little old you, can have fellowship with that mighty God 
because God gave you a spirit. You are a spirit. Your spirit lives in your body. You're born with that spirit, that ability to have fellowship with God. And the spirit makes even the lowest person in the whole world superior to the highest animal. Thus, the human race operates on three levels, physically with the body, socially with the soul, spiritually with the spirit. Now, the question is, what has happened to our spirits? The Bible says that our spirits are dead in sin and trespasses. We've rebelled against God and our spirits have been cut off from God and our spirits are dead. And the reason Jesus Christ came and died on the cross was to reconcile us to God. Sin has separated my spirit from God. I cannot fellowship with God. I cannot know God. I might study all my life theology and never find God. I might study philosophy all my life and never find God. I may be the most brilliant scientist in the world and never find God. Because something has become between my spirit and God, and that something is sin. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You are a sinner. I am a sinner, separated from God. This is a planet in which all human beings are born separated from God. You can be physically alive, soulishly alive, but spiritually dead. The Bible says, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she lives. There's a country western song this year that has an older cowboy singing to a younger one that's what needed is faster horses, younger women, older whiskey, and more money. And that's what the world is. Alive, but dead. Faster horses, alive, but dead. Very much like the man Jesus told about, who was a rich man, and he said, Soul, take thine ease, drink, and be merry. You've got many years. Build bigger barns. And God called him a fool and God killed him that night. And God said, thou fool. Many of you think that you have years and years and years and years. And you don't know that at this very moment, there is a point in a day that you are to meet God. And it may be this week. We never know. In this passage that I read, Lazarus, a person that Jesus loved very much and one of his closest friends, had died. And I watched the other night on television a replay of that magnificent picture of George Stevens, the greatest story ever told. And I thought one of the most dramatic scenes in the whole motion picture is when Lazarus is raised from the dead. And I thought of Lazarus as he was in that tomb. He'd been there for several days. And there are several things about him as I looked and thought about it. Lazarus didn't have any appetite. When he was alive, he got hungry regularly. But while he's dead, he doesn't have any appetite. And did you know if you're spiritually dead, your spirit is dead? You don't have any appetite for God. You don't have any appetite to read the scriptures and to have prayer and to talk about spiritual things. You're spiritually dead. You can go to church. Thousands of people today belong to the church that are spiritually dead. They don't really have any appetite for God, for fellowship with God. And the second thing about Lazarus I thought about was he, there was no activity. A spiritually dead person has no spiritual activity. They have much physical activity and social activity, but little activity on behalf of the kingdom of God. A few months ago, my wife and I went down to Guatemala with Luis Palau, who is here tonight. Right after the earthquake. 
And we saw devastation on a scale we have never seen anywhere in the world. And our hearts ached for those people. And I said, by the grace of God, we're going to do all we can for the hungry and the needy and the hurting people of the world, whether they're at home or whether they're abroad. Activity for the kingdom of God. And then another thing about Lazarus, there was no awareness. He was not aware of his friends. Dead men don't love. Dead men don't see danger. Dead men are, are unmoved by hunger. Dead men don't weep. And then the fourth thing, he was blind. And the Bible says that we too are blind. We have spiritual blindness. Your spirit can be blind. The Bible says the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. You are spiritually blind. And then the fifth thing about him was he smelled. He'd been dead for four days, and they said he already stinks. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says all of our righteousness and our goodness that we try to pile up to please God smells in the sight of God. It's like filthy rags, the Scripture says in Isaiah 64, the sixth chapter. We're saved by grace through faith that not of ourselves it's the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast and then the sixth thing about Lazarus was he was bound you know the Orientals method of embalming was one of the most effective the world has ever known it consisted of endless wrappings and yet you are alive tonight physically you're alive as far as your social activity is concerned but you are bound and spiritually dead you're bound by habits and sin Johnny Cash talked a moment ago about drugs and alcohol and men are bound by the chain of habit the lust and sin of drugs the lust for money the lust of the flesh the pride of life sex sin all of that indicates spiritual deadness Soulishly, you're alive. Physically, you're alive. But your spirit is dead toward God. Would you like to be made alive tonight? Totally, completely fulfilled? Totally alive? Spiritually? What can you do? Well, let's think, what can we do for Lazarus now? He's dead. Let's give him some food. They say, well, what we need to do is feed everybody. Jesus didn't feed everybody when he came. Do you know that? There are thousands of millions of hungry people in the world. We have compassion. We're to do what we can. But that does not bring about reconciliation with God. They have a deeper hunger, a deeper need to be met. And that's the need of reconciliation with God. You say, we'll give people better housing. That's all good. We ought to give people better housing, and I'm for everything that can give better housing to people in this country and people all over the world. But that doesn't bring back the spirit. The spirit is dead. Man has a deeper need. Man's greatest need is reconciliation with God, and that's what Christ came to do on the cross. You say, well, maybe they need more entertainment. Of the human race is a spiritual problem. The problem of the human race is not a soulish problem. The hu problem of the human race is not a physical problem. The problem of the human race is a spiritual problem. Man's spirit is separated from God. He hates, he lies, he cheats, he fights, he kills, he has war because his spirit is not right with God. So man needs to get his spirit straightened out with God. There's one great thing that a dead man needs. You know what it is? He needs life. And Jesus himself claims to be the life that spiritually dead men need. He said that the reason he came into the world was that he might give life more abundantly. He said, here's one of the greatest passages in all of literature. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, if you were a dead person lying in a grave, wouldn't you like to hear that? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. You believe in Jesus Christ. 
That means to commit to surrender your life to Him, to receive Him as your Lord and your Savior. And you can have spiritual life. In addition, the Bible says your body is someday going to be raised from the dead. You say, how can that be? I don't know how it can be. I only know that science says that no chemical is lost in the, in the world today. And the God that made it in the beginning can bring it together again. But your spirit will be joined to your body again in the future world if you know Jesus Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never, never, never die. Your spirit can be made alive and have fellowship with the God of the universe by believing in Jesus Christ. Now that is essentially and basically what the gospel is all about and that's why it's called good news to the world. That's what the word gospel means, good news. And it's good news to millions and billions of people who are dead toward God to say that there is a person that can give you spiritual life and change you and make you a new person. You don't get eternal life when you die. You get eternal life the moment you receive Christ. You can have fellowship with God through Bible reading, through prayer, through fellowship with other Christians. You have fellowship with God. Your spirit is alive. Your body may get tired. Your body may get hungry. Your body may be in prison. Your body may be destroyed by the scars of sin that have already taken place. But God will forgive the sin that came between you and God. He will help you and restore you in a thousand ways, but you've got to be willing to go all the way. You know why some people really never find God? They're not willing to go all the way. They want to go part way, third of the way, half way three-quarters of the way, 90% of the way, 99% of the way. But Jesus won't accept you. He says it's all the way. That's the reason he said in that chapter we read last night, he said, I will not commit myself to you. You believe in me, but I don't believe in you. I know what's in your heart. I know what you're holding back. You've got to be willing to surrender all if you are to have eternal life. Then he turned and he asked Mary and Martha, he said, Believest thou this? And Martha answered and said, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God that should come into the world. And you know, Jesus did an interesting thing. He wept. And the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. Only three times did Jesus weep. He wept at the grave of Lazarus. He wept at Gethsemane the night before Calvary. And he wept over the city of Jerusalem when he saw that Jerusalem was rejecting him as the Savior. And he weeps tonight, I believe, over the great cities of America as he sees the great majority of the people ignoring him, going on in their spiritual deadness, like dancing on the Titanic before it hit the iceberg. And he weeps. There are millions tonight in the tomb of sin. There are thousands here tonight in the tomb of sin. You need to be awakened. Many of you are in the grip of an evil habit, too strong to break, worse than a living death. What was Jesus' answer? He went to the tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. Do you know why I believe Jesus wept? I don't believe Jesus wanted to call Lazarus back. Lazarus was already in heaven. I don't believe Lazarus wanted to come back. You get a person that has died and gone to heaven just for one minute and they see the glory of heaven. Why, you couldn't pay them enough money in all the world to get them to come back. You and I weep for them. They're not weeping, they're happy. Their spirits are happy in total fellowship with God 
and their friends and the reunion and the happiness that's taking place there. Jesus wept, I believe, because he didn't want to have to call Lazarus back, but in order for his credentials as the Messiah to be established, he was going to raise the dead. So he said, Lazarus, come forth. If he hadn't said the name Lazarus when he said, come forth, every person that had ever died in the history of the world would have come out of the grave. So he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. But Lazarus was still tied in the old clothes. Jesus said, loose him. Now you and I have to be loosed. After we come to Christ, we have to be loosed from our sins, the things that bound us. We have to be set free. And there's many a person that says to me, Billy, I would like to come to Christ, but I don't think I could hold out. You're right. You can't hold out. But he'll hold you. And Johnny was telling us a moment ago about that verse in 1 Corinthians that he came across, and what a marvelous verse. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear, but will with the temptation make a way to escape. And even I forgot it, Johnny, because the, there's a phrase there that says God is faithful. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted. In other words, God makes a provision for your Christian life. He gives you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside and gives you supernatural power to live a supernatural life. And your spirit is made alive and you have fellowship with God. I'm asking you tonight, will you receive Christ? Are you willing to go all the way with him and commit everything to him? Your mind, your heart, your body, your friends, your family. And you would like to say tonight, I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want eternal life. I want Jesus to come into my heart tonight. I'm going to ask you to do something that we cannot do tonight. Every night, this stadium has been almost filled, not quite like it is tonight. And we put people on the floor tonight, and when we put you on the floor, we knew that we could not call people forward as we normally do. So I'm going to ask all of you that want to receive Christ, I want you to stand up where you are. We're not going to ask you to come forward. Just stand up where you are and stand there quietly and prayerfully and with bowed heads. And I'm going to ask every head bowed and every eye closed and everybody in an attitude of prayer. And tonight you want Christ in your heart. You want eternal life. Just stand up and keep standing all over the place. Hundreds of you, just stand up right now. And everyone in prayer. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1 877 772 4559. That's 1 877 772 4559. that are watching by television you can make your commitment to Jesus Christ right where you are with these hundreds and perhaps thousands here that are making their commitment to Christ right now you can say yes to Jesus Christ wherever you are God help you to make that commitment right now
If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your... From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want to take as our text tonight a passage in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. These words. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of all those things that are shaken as of things that are made, but those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Since we were here in the 50s and then in the 60s, things have changed. I was asking Joe Ulrich a moment ago, I said, don't you all still have street cars? It seems to me I've seen one since I've been here. And he said, yes, they've just put them in. And uh, I thought, well, that's the first city I've been to in a long time where they had street cars. The last I can remember was in Bucharest. They had street cars. And it took me back to my boyhood and childhood when we had street cars in our town of Charlotte, North Carolina. But many things have changed since we were here. And those of us that are senior citizens can really see a change in Portland. Things that you younger people take for granted. We were born before television, before frozen foods, before antibiotics, before nylons, before Xerox, before credit cards. For us, time sharing meant togetherness, not computers. And software wasn't even a word. We were before pantyhose and drip dry clothes before ice makers and dishwashers, Cheerios, instant coffee, decaffeinated anything, and, Mac and McDonald's had never been heard of. And I don't know how we lived. <laughs> if we'd been asked to explain CIA, VCR, UFO, ERA, NFL, or JFK, we, we would have said, well, that's alphabet soup. When you think of how our world has changed and the adjustments we've had to make, today's senior citizens are a pretty hardy bunch because we came along through all of that. There have been great political changes. Hungary. We were in the People's Stadium in Hungary about three or four years ago, and it had the largest crowd in its history to hear the gospel. 115,000 people in one service. South Africa would have never thought of having an integrated service in those days. We went to South Africa. We did not go until they guaranteed we could have integration. And we went there. And we can show you on film where the newspapers had headlines saying, Billy Graham says apartheid is sin. And uh, then there have been gigantic geophysical and ecological calamities across the world. I read last Sunday's Earth Week column in the Argonian, a diary of some of the things that happened on the planet last week. It talked of tropical storms last week, like the worst hurricane to slam into Hawaii in this century. It continued to report on the damage from Hurricane Andrew in Florida. Norman Mitsky's house, who is on our team, uh, looked like some giant hand had come down and just lifted the whole thing up and lifted everything out. We went to Homestead in southern Florida, and my son, who's here tonight, Franklin Graham, has an organization called Samaritan's Purse, and they had already gotten 10 trailers in place down there by the time we got there to see it. 
and what a devastation that was. You cannot imagine what happened in Southern Florida. You can't see it on television. Stefan Nelson, my grandson, spent his full time down there working, handing out water and bread and uh, things, and he saw on top of one roof this sentence that somebody had written. Okay, God, you got our attention. Now what? And the newspaper went on to mention Typhoon Sybil, the tropical storms, Payne and Roseland. Monsoon floods washed away entire villages in North India and Pakistan, killing thousands of people. There were earthquakes in Zaire and Nicaragua and minor shakes in many other parts of the world. These are just the things that came out of one newspaper. This is all in addition to environmental changes such as the sudden drop in levels of protective ozone over the Antarctic mentioned in the column that might signal major damage. I could go on and on. And that was just in your newspaper last week. We're living in a changing and increasingly dangerous world. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's not getting better. Do you have a purpose in your life and does life have meaning to you? Or is your life cracking up and going all to pieces? The big question today is, what is meaning? Fifty years ago when I started preaching, the philosophical question was, what is truth? Today's question is, what is the point? The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart, my heart, is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who would believe that after a storm hit Miami and southern Florida like Andrew, that there'd be looters taking advantage of it? I read an article in the Charlotte Observer last week that domestic violence cases are soaring after the hurricane in southern Florida. We don't know our hearts. We don't know what would happen till it actually happens. Andrew Morris, the great philosopher in France, wrote, the universe is indifferent. Who created it? Why are we here on this puny mud heap spinning in infinite space? He said, I have not the slightest idea. And there are many people that take that attitude. Albert Camus, who was the great philosopher that everybody quoted a few years ago, said, man cannot live without meaning. Are you trying to live without meaning in your life? Now here are some of the things that the philosophers were saying that people think about when they're alone. When you're alone, here's what many people that are here tonight think about. First, you think about, well, I have to suffer. Maybe now or soon. I must struggle to make ends meet. I must struggle in my marriage. I must struggle with my girlfriend, my boyfriend, because it seems that things are going wrong. I must struggle to make grades in school. I'm at the mercy of chance. I feel guilty all the time, and I don't know what I'm guilty of. I ask the question when I'm alone, who am I? I know that I must die, and I'm afraid to die. I don't want to die, but I know I'm going to have to die. Every person in this audience 75 years from now will be dead. A scientist recently asked the question on television, who made the earth? Why is it here? What is its future? We have the answer. We just don't know. Then he said an interesting thing. Perhaps we're all going to have to restudy the biblical account. And that's exactly what many atheists are doing today. They're restudying the biblical accounts. The first time I met Mr. Yeltsin in the Kremlin, I talked with him, and he told me that he'd been an atheist. But he said, I'm no longer an atheist. 
He said, I've come to believe that there's something beyond this life and something bigger than we are. And he said, I've started going back to church. And he said, my grandchildren are wearing crosses around their necks and I'm glad. Now that was a couple years ago before the coup. T.S. Eliot once wrote, where is the wisdom? Think of it now, where is the wisdom that we've lost in knowledge? We have a tremendous amount of knowledge. We have universities by the scores and hundreds and thousands throughout the world. But we've lost wisdom in the midst of all of our knowledge. Jesus said, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. In Luke 21, 25, distress. That word means that we're pressed from all sides. And perplexity means no way out. If you'd gone to Rio to that conference on ecology and how can we save this planet, you would have come away like many of them came away, confused and mixed up, discouraged and hopeless. President Kennedy said a quarter of a century ago, no man entering upon this office could fail to be staggered upon learning the harsh enormities of the trials through which he must pass in the next few years. How right President Kennedy was. He went on to say, each day the crisis multiplies, each day their solution grows more difficult, each day we draw nearer the hour of maximum danger and time is not our friend. In the midst of all these changes, there are certain things that have not changed and will never change. The first thing that has never changed in all these centuries, the nature of God has not changed. He said, I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi 3.6 The scripture says there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning with God. That means the batting of an eyelash. Not even that much change in God. In all these centuries, he's from everlasting to everlasting. He had no beginning. He has no end. I don't understand that, but I accept it. He's the one thing that we can count on is God. He's unchanging in his holiness. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is, is and is to come. Revelation 4, 8. God is unchanging in judgment. It says the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. God is unchanging in love. For God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. That's hard to believe, that's hard to take in, but God loves you. And if you were the only person in the whole world, God would love you, and we, he would have sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. God is love. That's one thing I want you to remember when we leave, that we've said. And then the second thing, the word of God has not changed. Not only the nature of God has not changed, but the word of God has not changed. This Bible, is the word of God. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And what you read in this book stands forever. It's a thrilling thing to take up this book and know that you are reading something inspired by God and it's his message to the human race. He tells us where we came from. He tells us where we're going. He tells us how to live every day. The third thing that hasn't changed, human nature has not changed. Jeremiah the prophet said, as I said a moment ago, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? 
All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. Sin means that I've broken God's laws. I've broken the Ten Commandments. If you have broken one commandment one time, you're guilty of all. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever had lust in your heart? Then you're guilty. We're guilty before God. And because we're guilty, we're under sentence of death. Death in this life and death in the life to come. The way of salvation has not changed. In all these centuries, the way of salvation is still the same. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved in Acts 4.12. John 14.6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. In the last generation, the only way to God was through Christ. In this generation, the only way to God will be through Christ. The only one in history of whom it is written, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Think of it. The wrath of God abides on you now. And the only way that wrath can be turned away is by the cross. When Jesus Christ took your sins on the cross, God could no longer see your sins because your sins were buried in the depths of the sea. And God cannot even remember your sins. Think of it. God cannot even remember. He has the ability to turn the tape recorder off and erase it. And God cannot remember your sins when you come to Christ at the cross by faith and repentance. Yes, God will never change. The Word of God will never change. But you have to change if you are to go to heaven. If you are to have a, a new life here and have purpose and meaning in your life, you have to change. The first thing you have to do is repent. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, the scripture says. The second thing is to believe, and that word believe means to commit. That's the marriage vow that we take. It's not just getting married, it's a lifetime commitment. My wife is here tonight, and she... Uh, And uh, we've had differences, like every normal couple. And someone asked her, had she ever thought of divorce? She said, no, but I have thought of murder. <laughs> I don't know where she's sitting, but sometime I'm going to ask her to explain that. But we have a wonderful marriage and we have a wonderful family and all of them know the Lord for which we give thanks to God. Now I want to ask you, do you know Christ? You see, Christ died for you. And on that cross, God laid on him the sins of us all. We deserved hell. We deserved judgment. We deserve to pay the price for our sins, but Jesus took them voluntarily on the cross. And on that cross, he had the capacity, because he was the God-man, to see you sitting here tonight. He looked ahead these thousands of years, and he could see you, and he knew you, and he knew all about you, and he loved you, and he's willing to forgive you and give you purpose and meaning in your life and change your life. Your life has to change. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you come to Christ? Has there been a time when you received him as your Lord and your Savior and said, Lord, with your help, I want to follow you. I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to pray and I'm going to be as faithful to you as I can. I can't live the Christian life alone. I'm a failure. Billy Graham cannot live the Christian life. 
I've tried. I can't do it. But with the help of the Word of God and the help of the Holy Spirit, I can live the Christian life. But He lives it through me. He produces the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace. All of these things are supernaturally produced in you by the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ. Some people say, I'm trying to hold on. You don't need to hold on. He holds you. Just turn loose and let Him come into your heart. How many of us We've been baptized. We go to church once in a while, maybe every Sunday. But deep in your heart, there's a doubt that you know Christ. You're not sure that if you died at this moment, you'd go to heaven. You want to be sure. You want to be certain. You want to know that your sins are forgiven. And you want to know that purpose and meaning that God can give to you. Are you willing to change your way of living. That's repentance, to change your mind, to change the direction of your life. And you can't repent by yourself. The Holy Spirit has to help you do that. And then you come by faith, and faith means commitment. When I stepped on this platform last night, I'd never been on this platform before. I didn't get down and examine it to see if it would hold me up. I accepted by faith that the carpenters that built it built it to hold a man. And by faith, you receive Christ in the same way. You totally commit yourself. You say, Lord, I'm not trusting anything else to save my soul except Jesus. I commit myself to Him. Young people today are looking for a cause. They're looking for a flag to follow. They're looking for something to really believe in. People are mixed up. They're confused. They don't know what to think. They're just angry. And many people think, can we hold together as a society? Come to Christ. He will meet all those longings and all those needs and give you a new life. He can come into your family. He can come into that office where you've been having trouble. He can come into your schoolroom. He can come into every phase of your life and make you a new person. He can make those ends meet. He can help you meet those payments. He can help you in looking for a job. He can give you total assurance that your sins are gone and that God will never hold you accountable for them again. They're forgiven. And he receives you with open arms and he'll do it tonight if you let him. And I'm going to ask you to do something we saw hundreds of people do last night. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want Christ to come into my heart. I want him to take all of me. I surrender my life to him. And I say, Lord Jesus, I am willing to repent of my sins and turn by faith to you and put my total confidence and my total faith in you. He died on the cross and shed his blood for you. And certainly you can come and take a stand here for him. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. That's the reason I ask people to come forward. Every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. Everyone, you look and see. There was one, Nicodemus came by night. But those that made their commitment to Christ came publicly. I'm going to ask you to come publicly and receive.